Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. So this is the fourth and final event of a wonderful seminar series uh, titled Economics for the Coolest Scientists, which was, has been organized by the Penn Science Policy and Diplomacy, Diplomacy Group at the University of Pennsylvania. So this group is a student organization that creates opportunities for early career scientists and engineers to get hands-on training and experience communicating science to policymakers, to diplomats, and to the broader public. So you can visit our website at psbdg.com, or you can follow us on Twitter at UPennSciPol. SciPol, so that's UPennSciPol. Okay, so Economics for the Clueless Scientists has covered public finance and macroeconomics, the impact of financialization on medical innovation, and on and our latest event, we covered income inequality and employment. And now we're ending it all with the defining crisis of our time, which is climate change. And so just as an introduction, you know, recently the Biden administration announced that the US is committing to transitioning to net zero greenhouse gas emissions in electricity generation by 2034 and in the entire economy by 2050. But what are the possible policy pathways that are available to achieve this goal? Does the US even have the required technological, logistical and productive capabilities to do this? What are the required changes to our law, to our regulations, to our institutions that are needed? And finally, can we do all of this while improving living standards and fostering socioeconomic justice? And so to discuss some of these issues and to bring some light to our attendees and inform us all about uh, uh, these problems, we have with us two excellent guests, Professor Jesse Jenkins and Professor Robert Hockett. So, uh, just brief introductions. So uh, Jesse Jenkins is an assistant professor at Princeton University in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering and the Andlinger Center for Energy and the Environment with courtesy appointments at the School of Public and International Affairs and the High Meadows Environmental Institute. Dr. Jenkins is a macro scale energy systems engineer. Engineer, he leads the Princeton Zero Lab, which focuses on improving and applying optimi optimization-based energy systems models to evaluate low-carbon energy technologies and generate insights to guide policy and planning decisions. Uh, he uh, serves on the National Academies of Science and Engineers, uh, Engineering and Medicine Expert Committee on Accelerating Decarbonization of the U.S. Energy System and was a principal investigator and lead author of Princeton's landmark Net Zero America study. Uh, finally, Dr. Jenkins has delivered invited testimony to multiple congressional committees and provides technical analysis and policy advice for nonprofits, policymakers, and early stage technology ventures working to accelerate the deployment of clean, clean energy. And we also have with us uh, Professor Robert Hockett, who is Edward, Edward Cornell, Professor of Law at Cornell University and former counsel at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and the International Monetary Fund. His interests lie in the fields of organizational, financial, and monetary law and economics in both their positive and normative, as well as their national and transnational dimensions. And his guiding concern in these fields is with the legal institutional prerequisites to a just, prosperous, and sustainable economic order. He's a fellow of, at, at New Consensus and the Century Foundation, and is a frequent consultant on matters of public finance and financial reform for federal, state, and local legislators, most recently on Build Back Better and the Green New Deal. So I want to welcome both of you. And this, you know, we will start with a talk by Professor Jenkins followed by a talk by Professor Hockett. And then afterwards, we'll hopefully have about 30 minutes for questions and discussion. For those of you who are attending, please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A uh, box throughout the event, and we'll make sure to, to have those questions answered uh, at the end of the event. So uh, without further ado, Professor Jenkins. 
Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to share this work. Um, I'm going to start with an overview of lessons from the Net Zero America study about potential pathways for the United States to reach uh, the goal of net zero greenhouse gas emissions, which requires a real transformation of how we make and use energy across all sectors of the economy. Uh, and so this study was a major two year long effort by uh, colleagues of mine at Princeton and, and other collaborators to look in depth um, with the highest degree of um, uh, granularity of any study to date of what that would actually mean in terms of the infrastructure we have to build across the country, impacts for things like employment, air pollution, public health, uh, the scale of capital that we need to mobilize and invest over the next uh, few decades uh, and other such impacts to try to make this transition, this critical transition that we have to make as a country uh, much more visceral and understandable uh, and to highlight some of the key choices and trade-offs that we face as we move down this pathway. Net zero emissions, of course, is the point where uh, total annual greenhouse gas emissions caused by human activities from energy, from agriculture, from other uh, human, uh, human uh, activities is offset exactly by removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere uh, in safe permanent storage of that CO2. So that's the balance point where we're no longer adding to atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases. In order to stabilize and avoid the worst effects of climate change, we need to bring the whole world to net zero uh, emissions and then potentially even to negative emissions to help uh, undo some of the damage that we're, we've already locked in. Um, and so, of course, the United States uh, has arguably a moral responsibility as the largest emitter historically uh, and the technical and financial means to ideally lead the way uh, in this transition. So that's what our report uh, focused on. Um, you can find the full report as well as a detailed data portal to dive into the numbers on what we found for different uh, results uh, at netzeroamerica.princeton.edu. So what we did in this study was look primarily at several different pathways that uh, could get us to this net zero goal. There are five of many, uh, obviously, we don't know exactly how the future is going to unfold. And if you ask, ask me to bet uh, which one of these we are going to, to use, I would probably say none of them. It'll be somewhere in between, uh, most likely. But what these pathways do is highlight a set of key choices uh, we have to make about the, the sort of building blocks of the net zero economy that we have at our disposal and how much we want to rely on each of those buildings. Blocks. So this chart shows the evolution of our total primary energy supply. That's all of the energy inputs into our economy uh, as raw fuels, which are then transformed and carried uh, into end use activities like transportation and heating and electricity generation. Um, so our primary supply today, as of you know the 20, 2020, is obviously and, um, dominated by fossil fuels, with the bulk of that being oil and gas, um, but over 80% of our total primary energy coming from fossil fuels today. Uh, we model the no new policies reference scenario that um, basically assumes business as usual demand uh, growth um, and no additional policies other than those that were already on the books as of the end of 2019. Uh, and in that case, you can see very little evolution of our energy system, right? We do see more renewable energy over time, more wind and solar, uh, a little bit of coal and nuclear retire as those plants age, expansion of our use of natural gas, um, but really a, a fossil dominated energy system persists with without additional policy action. So we need policy to spur us down this path. Um, and then the five net zero pathways by 2050 look dramatically different, right? They are all um, uh, overwhelmingly supplied by, by renewable energy sources. Um, and in one case, uh, a substantial contribution from nuclear power. Um, uh, but they have different, uh, different flavors to them. And what we do with these paths is basically highlight three different key kind of levers that we have to think about how much we want to push or pull on. The first is the degree of electrification of uh, end use demands like vehicles and buildings that currently use fossil fuels today, but could turn to clean electricity as their fuel source. So the E plus scenario is a high electrification case in which we uh, push electrification of vehicles uh, and building space heating and water heating um, largely to their maximum with a nearly 100% penetration of these technologies um, by 2050. The E minus case is a slower electrification scenario, still far more electric, electric uh, heating and transportation than today. But what we do is we basically push the sort of S curve of consumer adoption for those technologies back by a decade. And because that curve itself is nonlinear and there's turnover in the, in the stock of vehicles and buildings, which takes time, pushing things back on the adoption curve by about a decade results in only about 50 to 60% of the end use vehicle stock or uh, building stock by 2050, turning over to electric uh, heating and transportation. That scenario actually ends up consuming more total primary energy because 
Uh, electric drivetrains and heat pumps are more efficient overall at taking electricity and turning them into the services we care about, like transportation and heating, than relying on internal combustion or hydrogen combustion, as the case may be in some of these um, uh, alternatives in the E minus scenario. So you can see that even though we have less electrification, we actually consume more primary energy overall uh, to make things like hydrogen um, uh, and run uh, direct air capture to offset some of the additional reliance. On, on liquid and gaseous fuels in that scenario. This scenario also captures a lot more carbon dioxide um, uh, in this scenario to offset the remaining use of uh, oil and, and gas um, with about 1.5 billion tons or gigatons of CO2 captured and stored uh, or about 50% more than the E plus case. The other uh, three cases, oh, so the middle one I should say then is um, uh, a variant of our low electrification case where we rely a lot more on biomass or bioenergy. In four of the five scenarios, we limit the available supply of bioenergy to avoid converting large areas of land that are currently used for food or, or agricultural production uh, or forestry into bioenergy feedstock production. That means we can use residues from agricultural lands and forestry, as well as we assume the land that's currently growing uh, corn for ethanol production could be put to much better or more productive use um, growing uh, perennial grasses um, for uh, biomass gasification. Uh, to produce hydrogen or other fuels where we capture that CO2 and store it for negative emissions. So in four of the five scenarios, we basically use all of that available biomass supply because it's a very useful source of negative emissions and zero carbon fuel in a net zero economy. Um, but in the uh, E minus B plus case, we do have a lot more demand for liquid and gaseous fuels in the E minus scenario. And so one way to meet that would be to expand our reliance on biomass. So we, in that scenario, um, look at the full U.S. supply curve that the Department of Energy and Department of Agriculture estimate. That would involve a lot of converting land that currently grows food or is used for forestry to produce um, uh, uh, feedstocks for energy production. And that has all kinds of implications for global food prices, for land use, uh, for conservation priorities and other things. But it's one of the options at our disposal. So we wanted to look at that one. And then finally, the last two scenarios are high electrification variations where we either constrain uh, the role of renewable energy or rely on it entirely. So the RE minus case is a constrained renewable scenario where we assume just exogenously that the rate of growth of wind and solar is limited uh, to about 33 gigawatts per year. That's about 50% faster, 60% faster than we've achieved to date. But it tops out at that level. And that could reflect a whole bunch of different possible constraints, like the inability to build out transmission at the scale that we need to to connect all the wind and solar, uh, challenges over siting, where we're going to put these wind and solar farms, supply chain limitations, or, or other constraints. And so then the question is, what do we turn to instead of wind and solar? And in this scenario, you can see a much greater reliance on nuclear power, the uranium uh, bar in orange there, um, which is a scalable zero carbon alternative that grows if wind and solar are constrained. And this scenario also has the greatest reliance on natural gas and fossil energy overall. A lot of that natural gas, gas use is for stationary applications like hydrogen production from methane reforming uh, and power plants where we can capture and store that CO2. Um, and so this scenario has the greatest reliance on carbon capture as well. So if we can't build enough wind and solar, the alternatives are more reliance on nuclear and carbon capture. Um, and then finally, the 100% renewable scenario, RE plus is the last one, where we uh, prohibit the use of nuclear power and fossil fuels entirely by 2050, as well as any geologic storage of CO2. And so this scenario has a, a overwhelming reliance on wind and solar power, uh, with very large buildouts across the country on the order of uh, six or 7,000 uh, gigawatts of total capacity. We have about 1,000 gigawatts of overall generating capacity in the US today. So enormous amounts of wind and solar, um, but no reliance then on nuclear or carbon capture uh, or carbon storage. We still actually capture about 700 million metric tons of CO2 from biomass and from direct air capture in order to use for the production of synthetic uh, liquid and gaseous fuels, uh, synthetic methane or uh, diesel or jet fuel uh, produced from hydrogen and uh, carbon neutral CO2, either from uh, biomass or, or direct air capture. That's the only solution to fully eliminate the remaining liquid and gases fuel needs when we don't um, uh, have any reliance on fossil fuels anymore. So very different scenarios available to us, all of them using technologies that we fundamentally know how to build. They're not scientific breakthroughs that have to come out of a laboratory. Some of them are less mature than they need to be, and we need to focus on improving and scaling them up. Um, and so this presents the array of choices that we have um, across the different dimensions at our disposal. Now, the good news is that all of these uh, scenarios are affordable 
if transformational um, in their in their scope. So if you look at our energy expenditures as a share of our gross domestic product or GDP, or how much of our total uh, economic activity is going to pay for energy services. Historically, you can see that during prosperous periods of time, that's been between about five and 8% of our GDP. And during times of economic crisis or oil price shocks, that can shoot up like it is right now um, to much higher shares. So that in 2005, in the run-up of energy prices or 2007 and eight before the Great Recession, that shot up to about 10% in the oil price shocks of the late 1970s and 80s and went all the way up to over 13% of GDP. Going forward, you can see that all of our scenarios are much more affordable than the historic expenditures on GDP, uh, with about 4 to 6% of our GDP spent on energy services across all of these cases. Through 2035 or 2040, they're all pretty much the same cost, um, and only by uh, 2050 do they start to diverge. So we really have a lot of confidence that we can move forward on these paths without significant expenditures. This does not require a World War II style mobilization of 20, 25% of our GDP or our workforce to try to build this clean energy economy. We can do it if we're smart about how we allocate our human and uh, financial capital away from fossil energy and our con conventional infrastructure and towards uh, the construction of a net zero emissions energy system. Now it is cost more than doing nothing, right? This does require some policy action. Although I'll stress that this reference line assumes the same oil and gas price scenario as all of the other cases. And then you would expect from basic economics that in a scenario where we consume less oil and gas, that prices would be lower and vice versa. So it's likely that this reference case would actually be higher. And of course, we know that it's not a nice smooth line when you depend on oil and gas. As we see today, we are um, still quite vulnerable economically to uh, oil price shocks. Um, so it's likely that this reference case would be much more volatile as well, um, uh, where our, uh, in contrast, our net zero scenarios would insulate the US economy and make them much more secure uh, against economic uh, uh, costs of oil price shocks and, and global geopolitical conflict like we're seeing today. Um, the good news is it's affordable, but of course, these are not easy. Uh, they're transformational changes to our energy system, and that's really what we wanted to focus on in this study, looking very clearly at some of the key uh, transformations of our energy system and their implications for uh, our economy. We highlight th uh, three big transformational challenges and one big benefit. The first is the scale of our physical infrastructure that we have to build out. The second is capital mobilization. How much do we need to bring forward to invest in these energy systems? The third is how we transform our energy workforce. And the fourth is the substantial reductions in air pollution and improvements in public health that result from this net zero transition. So if we look at the scale of the infrastructure, let's focus in on electricity first, which is one of the critical linchpins in the overall energy system. This chart here shows our current energy mix uh, where we consume about 4,000 terawatt hours of generation. It's about 60% fossil fueled and about 40% carbon free with half of that coming from our existing nuclear fleet. The lines here show the demand for electricity over time in three of our uh, main scenarios here, which grow by more than double through 2050, 115 to 170% growth. The 100% renewable scenario has much greater demand uh, for electricity to produce hydrogen actually grows 300% uh, by 2050. So it's sort of off the top of the chart here. And then if we think about how rapidly we have to phase out coal and then steadily reduce our reliance on natural gas with maybe some existing nuclear retirements over time, those shrinking bars on the bottom are what we can probably count on from our existing energy electricity generation infrastructure. That means then the gap between that demand and our generation mix is what we have to build in terms of new clean energy infrastructure over time. So to put that into context, over the next eight years now through 2030, we will have to more than double all carbon-free electricity generation in the country today. And since nuclear and hydropower are unlikely to expand and may even shrink over time, that means a roughly fourfold increase in the amount of wind and solar capacity in the system over the next eight years. So rapid build-outs of new wind and solar. But that's just getting started. By 2050, we would need to build twice all current electricity generation. So to put that another way, it took us roughly 150 years to build out our current electricity system. And over the next 30 years, we have to build that same amount of capacity twice, or once roughly every 15 years. So you can get a sense of the scale of change that we're talking about. This is affordable, but it is rapid and transformational. And unless we have the right commitment and public policy environment to get that done, it's not going to happen at the pace that we need. To get a sense of what that looks like across the country, we conducted a detailed downscaling of our results 
to take the macro scale energy modeling from something like this, a nice bar chart that you know doesn't connect with us all that viscerally, down to a, um, a map of what this might look like across the country. So this map shows our existing high voltage transmission system in uh, gray, our large urban areas where most of the demand and people are. Um, and then the existing build out of wind farms across the country in uh, blue. And if you look very closely, there's some large utility scale solar farms that are a bit hard to see at this uh, scale of the map. This is about 200 gigawatts of uh, wind and solar built to date. Um, and by 2030, this is what the expansion would look like in the E plus scenario with about 600 gigawatts of new wind and solar capacity built over the next uh, decade. Um, so again, uh, a 4x increase in the total amount of capacity installed um, and about a 60% increase in the amount of long distance transmissions in our grid in order to connect those sites, particularly the wind farms, uh, which are far from demand centers, uh, to move that power to where we consume it. And then by 2050, the map could look something like this. Again, one possible notional build out of the scale of uh, wind and solar. And this is the high electrification case, um, not the 100% renewable one. That one actually has about double this amount of renewables. The constrained renewables case it has about half this much build out. So you can see the huge spatial extent of uh, wind and solar siting and the need to roughly triple the overall amount of transmission capacity in the United States over this period. So again, we're going to build the total amount of generating capacity that we have to date twice again over the next 30 years. We need to do the same thing with our transmission capacity as well. That's not the only uh, network infrastructure we might have to build. Uh, if I can get this to load here. Uh, we may also need to build an entirely new national carbon dioxide transport and storage network to capture CO2 from biomass facilities in particular in green, but also natural gas, uh, power plants, cement facilities, uh, and other industrial sources across the country, and move that from where it's captured to where we can store it safely in large geologic basins. The bulk of that storage capacity is located in the Gulf Coast region. Um, and so this network actually is built out to move most of the CO2 um, from where the biomass is, which is hard to transport over long distances uh, to the Gulf Coast region and other uh, geologic storage basins. This is a billion ton scale network capturing a billion tons of CO2 per year um, uh, in 106,000 kilometers of pipelines. That's about 30 or 40 percent of our existing uh, inter interstate gas pipeline system. Uh, and we require about $170 billion in capital investment. All right, so that's the physical infrastructure or, or physical capital. What about the financial capital? While our energy system and energy system expenditures remain affordable, we are shifting from an energy system that is fuel intensive, where we're burning fuel every year with ongoing uh, uh, cost, to a very capital intensive energy system where we invest upfront in things like wind and solar and transmission and efficient buildings and electric vehicles, which then pay themselves back over time in lower operating costs. And so we would finance these things and pay them off in annual expenditures that don't go up, but we do see a substantial need for capital investment upfront, which is quite a bit larger than a business as usual environment. We estimate that over the next decade, we would need to ha have about two and a half trillion dollars of additional capital investment across energy uh, infrastructure and um, uh, buildings and vehicles. You can see the breakdown in each of these boxes of where that infrastructure or where that investment would go. The biggest chunks going to renewables and transmission, but also building out our CO2 transport network, electrifying vehicle fleet, uh, improving efficiency and installing heat pumps in buildings, uh, and improving industrial energy efficiency and process efficiency. We also highlight the need for about $130 billion of what we call option creation investments. This is early scale demonstration and deployment of technologies that we don't necessarily need in the 2020s but we'll need to be mature in the 2030s and 40s. And if we don't invest in them proactively now, as we did for wind and solar and electric vehicles and LEDs uh, a decade ago when they were expensive alternatives, they won't be mainstream affordable options when we need them. So we highlight a range of those investments that we need to make as well. So this in many ways is the policymaker to-do list, right? We need policy that's going to induce this additional investment in each of these sectors. Um, and that's uh, the message that we took to Capitol Hill and to elsewhere. Uh, to try to um, guide policymakers in their development of legislation, including the Build Back Better Act. 
The third big transformation is in our energy workforce. You can't build an entirely new energy system if we don't transform our energy workforce as well. So we looked in detail at the transformation of the types of jobs and their location across the country. What we find is that almost every state sees net growth in energy-related employment as we transition to wind, solar, and grid-related jobs in particular, um, with uh, declines uh, over time in fossil-related employment. However, at that, while that high-level takeaway uh, is promising, that hides under, underneath it uh, significant shifts in local economies and dislocations of conventional employment in the energy sectors in oil and gas, primarily in the 2030s and 40s, uh, and in coal in certain, uh, a few states that are coal dependent um, in the near term. And that has to be proactively managed. Um, uh, as a just transition strategy, uh, as well as to ensure political support for this transition over time, uh, given that we need policy to sustain this transition and growth. So delivering real tangible job growth while mitigating the dislocations and effects of our energy transition on current employment and economic sectors is going to be a critical part of the net zero challenge. Now, finally, a uh, purely good news story, um, which is that we will dramatically reduce air pollution across the country as we transition to a net zero emissions economy. Not only do we tackle CO2, but all of the criteria and air pollutants that go with our fossil energy combustion today. We estimate that over time in our high electrification scenarios, air pollution from energy activities is virtually eliminated uh, by 2050 with, over, with about 400,000 premature deaths from air pollution avoided over the next three decades. So this is the per capita mortality rate from our energy activities today. And by 2050, that map could look like this with very minimal uh, air, uh, air pollution related mortalities left across the country, largely due to the residual upstream uh, oil and gas extraction in certain regions of the country. You can see the, the North Dakota, West Texas and the, the Marcellus region. So um, this, is, this comes from electrifying vehicles, uh, getting rid of air, air pollution from our cars, trucks and buses. Uh, from electrifying building heating so we're no longer burning natural gas inside our homes or oil um, and transitioning our electricity fleet uh, to a very low emissions uh, clean energy uh, mix. All of that delivers massive public health benefits that if you count the public health cost savings um, uh, associated with that are on the similar magnitude, a couple trillion dollars of benefits as the incremental cost of, the, uh, of energy expenditures, even in a worst case scenario across this transition. So to wrap up, I want to talk about how far we've come since we released the Net Zero America study report in early 2020 as the Biden administration took office uh, and Congress uh, started session in, uh, in, in the current uh, 117th Congress. And the unfortunate news is not nearly as far as we would like. We've been conducting another study called the Repeat Project, which you can find at repeatproject.org, um, which assesses the uh, policy impacts of current, uh, pen and or currently pending and recently passed legislation, including the Infrastructure Act and the Budget Reconciliation Bill, the Build Back Better Act, that passed the House uh, last fall. What we found, this will load, um, is that the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, or IIJA, accomplishes only about 9% of the emissions reductions that we need between now and 2030 to hit our national co commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 50% below 2005 levels or 50% below peak U.S. emissions. That leaves 91% of the job unfinished by current legislation. In contrast, if we passed the House passed version of the Build Back Better Act, if the Senate took that up and passed it, it would put us within very close uh, shooting distance of the 2050 or 2030 goal, cutting emissions by um, uh, about 90% of what we need to do uh, between now and 2030. So huge transformative impact if we can pass that legislation. If we don't, we're really just stuck on the starting block. So the dotted line at the top is frozen policy before the infrastructure bill. And you can see the very small reductions that we get um, from the infrastructure act um, that push that business as usual path down only very little, uh, a couple hundred giga, uh, million tons of emissions reductions. That would leave us, if nothing else passes, uh, about 1.3 billion tons short of our 2030 target. That's a huge gap that is unlikely to be filled entirely via state action or regulatory policy alone, um, which really puts the onus on Congress to get the job done uh, in this Congress before time runs out. If we can do that, this is where we might end up with only about 120 million tons short of our goal, a gap that could easily be closed by more favorable technological innovation or further action from states and regulate, regulatory policy like EPA regulations. 
So we really do, uh, we really are still at a critical moment where congressional legislation is needed to put us on the path to net zero emissions and to our 2030 emissions goals, without which we are in a very uh, uh, precarious position um, and unlikely to reach our 2030 uh, targets on time. I'll leave it there, um, and I'm excited to hear Robert's uh, comments as well, uh, as well as the, uh, the discussion to follow. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Jenkins. Oops, where did that go? Oh my God. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I think I lost my video, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Professor Jenkins and, you know, Professor Hake, it's, you have the floor. Great. All right. Thanks so much. So I was going to um, uh, sort of organize my, my brief uh, presentation uh, under sort of three categories. I was going to start by talking about the nature of the challenge that we face and the scale of the challenge that we face, uh, then move to uh, the nature of the opportunity uh, that we face and the sort of scale of that opportunity. And then finally, third, uh, to uh, the plan, the financial plan um, uh, or the financing plan that I put together uh, to sort of um, meet uh, the challenge and, and take advantage of the opportunity. Um, Jesse has done such a fantastic job of, of laying out the nature and the scale uh, of the challenge that I think what I'll do is abbreviate my presentation a little bit um, by leaving uh, the scale of the challenge and the nature of the challenge with what, uh, basically leaving it where Jesse uh, uh, left it because again, he's a, a done a terrific job of laying it out. So what I'm gonna do instead then is, is basically focus first of all on the sense in which we're faced with a remarkable opportunity here. Uh, and then with the best means I think of uh, sort of capitalizing on that opportunity. Um, and by way of sort of reference, um, I'm basically um, uh, kind of cribbing off of uh, a book I put out uh, in 2020 uh, called Financing uh, the Green New Deal, a uh, plan of action and, um, and renewal. Um, and Zakaria can uh, share with any of you uh, that, that book if any of you want to have a look uh, uh, at it. It grew out of the financing plan that I put together uh, for AOC's team, um, uh, because as some of you guys might know, um, I worked on that team uh, in 2018 on the way into the White House, I mean, sorry, on the way into Congress. Uh, and then of course, after um, uh, 2019, when, uh, when, when she took office. Uh, so a lot of the work that I've done kind of grows out of that particular involvement and is sort of in Formed by it as well, and I owe an awful lot, uh, by the way, to to the, my teammates um, um, in AOC's office and on her team. Anyway, so let's start then with the nature of the opportunity that we face, or the sense in which the challenge that we're facing right now amounts to an opportunity as well. Um, so the thing is, um, even if there were no particular um, uh, planetary uh, peril that we were facing, even if there were no uh, climate change problem that we were facing, we would be facing another problem uh, of, si uh, of sort of similar. Um, existential import. And that is uh, the absolute hollowing out uh, of the American economy, the hollowing out of American productive capacity, the hollowing out of American infrastructural capacity, uh, and ultimately uh, over time then the hollowing out of American state capacity or, 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 or government capacity. Um, in other words, um, the, 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 the many malaises and, and the many uh, sort of dysfunctions that we seem to be facing these days, um, both as a matter of American politics and as a matter of uh, American uh, uh, society and and, and the economy uh, more broadly, all, all seem to be rooted uh, in a, a steady sort of degradation of our basic capacities uh, of production um, and hence our uh, basic capacities of uh, uh, state function. Uh, what that means in turn then uh, is that we would actually be faced with the challenge of reindustrialization um, and rejuvenation of our productive capacities as a people and as an economy, even were it not the case uh, that we're faced with, uh, with uh, again, climate change, with existential climate peril. Um, the reason that this ends up, I think, amounting to a kind of opportunity uh, is because it is very easy to make plain to many people who are not convinced by the peril of climate change that we do have to modernize, that we do have to rejuvenate our productive capacity, nonetheless, as a matter of national security, and that we would have to do so even were there not any kind of climate change underway. Another way to put this is to say that many people on one particular side of the congressional aisle, uh, many people who are more associated perhaps with one political party than another, who evince climate skepticism uh, or who feel compelled to evince climate skepticism even when it's not necessarily sincere, um, are much more comfortable admitting and real and agreeing um, that the nation is now faced with significant peril 
simply as a result of the loss of our productive capacity, the loss of our productive prowess as a kind of workshop of the world of the kind that we once were. Now, here's why that's good news. It happens to be the case that most spheres of productive activity that require modernization and upgrading will bring about greenification if we do that modernizing and upgrading for the simple reason that state-of-the-art productive technologies and infrastructural technologies and the like just tend to be green now in a way that they didn't used to be in the past. In other words, we don't manufacture lots of kerosene lamps anymore. We don't manufacture lots of whale oil lamps anymore. And when we put together new factories, when we build new productive capacities, we don't tend to do it by basically building uh, factories or whatever that involve the burning of wood or other such things. So you can get a lot of greenification bang for the buck, so to speak simply by modernizing itself. Now I'm not suggesting that that alone suffices to, to, to bring about a sufficient degree of greenification, but I am saying that you can get a lot of people on board for a national project of productive rejuvenation even when some of those people would not be able to be brought on board if you were pitching your project prim primarily as a project of national greenification. So what we can do then is by emphasizing the need to restore our productive capacity and our productive prowess that we once had by restoring, by if, if we push the fact that we need to do that, we can actually mobilize enough, I think, political support and social support behind a modernization effort that will also be a greenification effort. That's the first point that I wanted to make in this connection, the sense in which we're faced with a kind of opportunity. A related point, or what really amounts to a kind of riffing on the same observation, is that one silver lining uh, that the COVID pandemic seems to have brought with it is it has really brought home the sense in which we made a terrible mistake, we engaged in a terrible blunder insofar as we systematically and seemingly unrelentingly over the course of the 80s and 90s and early 2000s outsourced our own productive capacity over those decades, right? Insofar as we basically outsourced or offshored our productive abilities, our productive capacities, we were making a terrible mistake. It was fairly obvious to many of us at the time that it was a mistake, but now it's been brought home to many people who didn't recognize it at the time as having been a mistake that it was. You basically hear an admission of that pretty much anytime you hear the phrase supply chains used right now. You hear lots of talk about how um, the, um, how the um, uh, COVID pandemic has sort of underscored uh, the sense in which we are now vulnerable uh, when it comes to supplies of various essential that we need. Um, you also hear, of course, lots of talk about um, the reemergence uh, of consumer price inflation as an economic problem. And if you think about it, that too is in effect a recognition that the country has a production problem or a supply problem. Because as any of you will know, if you think about it even for a second, inflation is always a relation. Right? It's a relation between money supplies on the one hand and goods and services supplies on the other, to put it in a kind of somewhat crude, simplified form. Form. It's always about the relation between money and goods that can be purchased with money. In order to uh, support demand economy-wide, when the pandemic was really taking off in early 2020, we quite understandably took lots of demand support measures, basically adding to consumer purchasing power, trying to keep people spending, keep people uh, able to afford to live in the midst of all the shutting down that was going on during the pandemic. But one thing we didn't do enough of, even though it wasn't for want of some of us trying or trying to get people to do this as well, was to take supply support measures at the same time and on the same scale. And one reason then, indeed the biggest reason right now that we're facing a resurgence or a return of inflation, just at least for the time being, is precisely the fact that we did lots of demand support, but no supply support. And I think people are finally beginning to recognize that too. So this is another uh, angle from which then I think we are going to see broad public support that can be mobilized in favor of a restoration of productive capacity here in the US, a restoration of the US's previous role as a kind of workshop to the free world as it were. Now, how does that link up 
with greenification, with our effort essentially to go uh, to zero emissions and to sort of modernize our economy into a clean economy that's not a world destroying economy? Well, in a number of fairly obvious ways. For one thing, uh, the US is far from alone. Indeed, if anything, the US is kind of behind many peer jurisdictions and most other countries in recognizing the nature of the problem that the world is faced with now in climate change. And in consequence, it's entirely under, it's, it's, it would be, you would be crazy not to, it seems to me, recognize that there's going to be mass growing global demand for clean technologies uh, going forward. In other words, EVs are going to be the dominant automobiles that are demanded. Uh, battery technology is going to be very much more demanded than it has been. Solar technology, uh, photovoltaic cells, but also various uh, improvements on existing solar panel technology are going to be, is going to be an industry of the future. Wind technology, uh, hydro technology, all of the renewable or clean technologies are going to be massive global markets in the near future. Indeed, they're already becoming that. And the funny thing is that the US actually was the site at which many of these technologies were invented. The problem is that the US seems to be better at inventing things than coming up with ways of mass producing and marketing them. We seem to have seeded that particular expertise elsewhere. And my guess would be that many Americans even who are skeptical of climate change would be quite amenable uh, to the idea of restoring the US to a sort of dominant world manufacturing position by going big into the technologies that we've invented that are going to be the principal technologies of tomorrow and that are going to underwrite the primary markets uh, of tomorrow. That's another sense then in which we are presently faced with a great opportunity that in a sense is the sort of counterpart uh, to the great uh, challenge uh, that we meet that, that Jesse has given us some idea uh, of the scale of. So that of course then raises the question, well, okay, how to act on this opportunity? How do we exploit or, or capitalize on this opportunity to sort of restore and rejuvenate um, and revivify uh, America's productive capacity on the one hand and to do so in a manner that basically saves the climate and saves the earth on the other hand, or at least contributes our fair share to saving the climate and saving the earth on the other hand. That's not terribly difficult. Uh, as Jesse himself has in effect uh, sort of suggested, right? This is not nearly as difficult as people might think, notwithstanding the scale. All that you need is to get the plumbing right, right? To get the, organi the organizing of the financing right. So here's where the sort of plan um, that I put forward uh, comes in. Um, I'll say a little bit first about the sort of inspiration to the plan and then a bit about the details. Um, so the inspiration is largely the case of the Second World War. A lot of people seem to have forgotten how we ended up financing the Second World War effort and what the challenge was that we faced when the war broke out and what we had to do in order to enable ourselves to sort of deal with it once it had broken out on the other hand. So um, to go back just really briefly to 1940, uh, when the Germans overran France in the spring of 1940, the whole world in effect said OS, oh, like holy, you know, holy S. Um, nobody had expected uh, Germany to be able to overrun France that quickly. They had sort of expected the Second World War would sort of end up being looking a bit like the First World War in Western Europe basically a static affair with long lines of trenches kind of looking at each other in no man's land, a very gradual, very slow progress, if any progress at all. So when Germany just sort of swept in and defeated France within just a number of weeks, people were quite horrified and they realized, well, maybe we better speed up uh, our mobilization efforts to be ready to sort of deal with any challenges that we might face along those lines. So Roosevelt, uh, the president at the time, uh, went before Congress and he said to them, look, um, we're going to have to sort of shift into the high gear when it comes to producing the means of defending ourselves and prosecuting a world war if it comes to that. And so I would like by the end of this year to be producing 50,000 warplanes per annum. Now at the time, many people thought he must be joking because this was a year uh, at which the previous, during the previous year, 
the total number uh, of aircraft manufactured by the US aircraft uh, industry have been barely over 3,000. So a jump up from barely over 3,000 to 50,000 within just six to seven months seemed to many to be a bridge too far, to put it uh, mildly. Um, as it happened, by the end of the year, we were producing at a rate of about 60,000 warplanes per year. And that's not to say anything, that's not to mention uh, the sudden um, um, mobilization of, of ships building capacity, the sudden mobilization of tank building capacity, uniform uh, uh, and, and boots and other war material capacity, and even the jump starting of entirely new industries, including the synthetic rubber industry, because at the time where we were getting all of our rubber was from Southeast Asia, which had been inconveniently successfully invaded uh, by Japan. So it was necessary uh, to move very rapidly and to uh, lever up production massively very quickly. So how did we do it? What was the secret? What was the way that, what did we, um, how did we actually bring this about? Well, a couple of things. The first thing was that President Roosevelt seems to have recognized immediately that it was going to be necessary for the public and the private sector to work very closely together in planning the war effort, in making sure that efforts were coordinated between public and private sectors, and also between particular subsectors of the economy as a whole, in order to avoid unnecessary duplications on the one hand, and in order to avoid um, uh, incoherent sort of uh, positions at cross purposes uh, among different uh, industries or, or agencies uh, on the other hand. So uh, Roosevelt put together a war production and a war planning board uh, that included um, essentially captains of industry on the private sector side with various public sector planners as well. They met and began to determine what the needs were for war production and how best or how most efficiently to sort of meet these particular needs and how to do so in ways again where essentially the synergistic benefits of, of entities that were working in complementary ways, mutually complementary ways, rather than mutually sort of uh, uh, defeating ways, um, how, how that would work, how that might be done. Uh, another secret was that there was, apps, or another sort of key, uh, was that there was no compunction about public spending if it was public spending that looked pretty clearly apt to enable much more private production, much more private sector production. So one of the real key uh, moves that was made by the Roosevelt administration at the time was actually publicly to build factory capacity or to build out or to grow existing uh, factory capacity so that there would be plants everywhere where they were needed, everywhere where production could be conducted and then to lease these particular facilities cheaply or almost at zero rates to the private sector producers who would then do the producing in those places. At the same time, the administration recognized that the people who'd be working at these facilities would need health care and that they would need places to live and that their kids might need schools to go to and so forth. And that power might have to be directed toward the neighborhoods where these workforces would be building up around these new plants, these new places where all the building and the production would be going on. They they thought it through, they thought through all of it, all of the sort of mutually complementary aspects of building entire new industries or expanding um, industries rapidly and massively from scratch, more or less, all that would be entailed by doing that. Now, it seems to me that we have to do something or that we'll want to do something sort of similar when it comes to essentially remaking um, uh, America's productive infrastructure and uh, American industry to a great degree, insofar as we've hollowed out our own manufacturing capacities, and insofar as we've basically given up the production of the things that are going to be most in demand uh, in the coming decades as we transition worldwide to a green economy on the other. So it seems to me that what we need to do or what we might want to do is to do is to take measures that are effectively contemporary analogs of those sorts of measures that we took during um, in the early days of the Second World War or in the Second World War mobilization. And what that has amounts to, the way to sort of institutionalize that in a manner that uh, sort of coheres nicely with and amounts to just sort of incremental variations on institutions that we already have is essentially to do the following. So the first part uh, of the finance plan uh, that I put together is the establishment of what I call a, a National Reconstruction and Development Council, which would essentially be constituted by the president, the vice president, the Fed chair, the treasury secretary, and then the heads of all of the cabinet level executive agencies in the White House, right? All of the cabinet level executive agencies 
with jurisdiction over the nation's primary industries and infrastructures. On this council, in addition, in an ex officio capacity, would be sitting various heads of private sector industry, industries in particular that are going to be implicated by what we have to do to retool the American economy along the lines that I've just described. That would be, of course, an analog to all of the private sector captains of industry who are included on the War Planning Board and various other uh, Roosevelt uh, empaneled panels that uh, planned the Second World War effort. The purpose of this council would be to develop and to con continually update uh, and, and change in, uh, sort of edit in light of changing circumstances, a coherent plan that basically redoes, rebuilds the American productive economy across the country in ways that are, again, don't involve incoherence, uh, in incoherencies or, or uh, operations at cross purposes from one another. You need, in other words, to be able to coordinate different aspects of the nation's entire infrastructure and different industrial subsectors of the entire industrial sector of the country. You need to be able to put together a broad plan that determines A, where investment is most needed, B, where it's going to be most helpful or, or, or more e most equitable to build new capacity, to sort of put people to work in regenerating the economy that we have. Uh, and you need to be able to do all of this in ways where, again, you don't have, say, the Department of Transportation pursuing one set of policies that is somehow at cross purposes um, with what the Department of Energy is doing or what some other department is doing. So some sort of a council like that, that would regularly meet and put together, a, again, a, a single coherent plan that is regularly updated rather in the way we planned the Second World uh, War effort. Note that we used to do something kind of like this uh, before the 1960s. We used to have something like a kind of national development policy as part of public policy in this country way up until after the Second World War. Somewhere during the 1960s, we got the idea that development is a sort of one-off affair or a one-off achievement, that you start as an undeveloped country, then you develop, and then you're done. Uh, that's not how development works. Development is something that you're always having to redo because technology doesn't sit still. And what you need to be able to do is constantly to sort of reconfigure uh, your economy in graceful ways to sort of gracefully make use of and integrate new technological capacities as they come along in order basically smoothly to be self-renewing as an economy at all times, forever and ever and ever. Um, you know, as the great development economist, I guess Bob Dylan put it, he not busy being born is busy dying. You kind of got to do that with an economy as well. An economy is always being reborn, uh, but you have to be able to enable or facilitate that kind of rebirth in a kind of coherent way that doesn't involve um, uh, an intolerable uh, amount of displacement and an intolerable amount of injustice and an uh, intolerable uh, amount of, 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 um, uh, of destruction. Um, so the council is the first part of the plan. Um, the second part of the plan uh, is to make use of an existing institution. Oh, and note, by the way, that the council is in effect kind of making a new kind of use of an existing institution. And that's, again, the White House cabinet. We're simply formalizing it uh, with respect to a particular purpose, um, uh, uh, and, and, and in that sense, adding to its, its functionalities, but not adding to its powers. Um, all right. The second part, then, as I noted, as I began to say a moment ago, uh, makes use of another institution that we already have uh, that we can upgrade or that we can just sort of uh, repurpose, uh, depending on uh, how ambitious we want to be. Um, that is the Federal Financing Bank, or FFB, uh, within Treasury. Now, the way FFB works at present is it works as as the funder of the various existing federal agencies in their various operations, right? So if the Department of Transportation, for example, uh, is behind some expansion project in connection with um, the, the interstate highway system or what have you, uh, it might do what it does in connection with that project in any number of ways. It might make direct expenditures of its own. It might extend loans to some contractor or some other entity or it might guarantee loans that are made to some other entity. There are various ways in which our various federal agencies provide funding for or spend funding on various uh, projects. 
all of that comes from the FFB. The FFB is, in a sense, the sort of distributor cap. It's the kind of central coordinating entity that directs all of that funding across the various federal agencies. And one of the reasons for that is that it is able effectively by, uh, by sort of folk, by concentrating and coordinating in that particular way uh, to reap the benefits of uh, low, low cost borrowing uh, that the treasury itself enjoys, uh, which the individual or separate uh, executive agencies would not uh, themselves enjoy and did not enjoy um, before uh, FFBs being brought into existence in 1973. Now, all we would have to do with FFB uh, to make it a, a more helpful institution for these particular purposes, the, the purpose of, again, sort of rejuvenate, uh, rejuvenating or, or remaking, in effect, um, the uh, country's productive capacity and productive economy along green lines, um, would be to uh, empower it to do a couple of uh, things that it currently can't do, uh, both at the sort of intake end and at the output end. At the intake end, what you would do is allow the FFB to gather funds, not simply uh, from appropriations from Congress, and not simply through the issuance of treasury securities, but also through the sale of instruments associated with particular securitization trusts, particular basically um, uh, trusts that would be essentially pooled public and private investment trusts that could then specialize in making investment money available for various projects of various kinds. You might, for example, have a transportation infrastructure fund. You might have um, uh, a solar energy fund. You might have a hydro fund or what have you, where you could have then public money and private money mixed together in single funds that would then be directed to particular kinds of projects named, of course, for those particular funds. That's at the input end. At the output end, you would empower the FFB not simply to make loans to uh, the various uh, executive level agencies uh, as it does now, but you would enable it also either to make direct uh, loans to private sector entities or to public private, mixed public private entities or partnerships or perhaps to enter into consortia with private sector lenders and other public sector lenders to help finance various projects. Basically, you would give it, in other words, a great deal more flexibility, both at the input end and at the output end, when it comes to operating as a kind of national investment bank. But again, one with enough limited scope and one that would be sufficiently subject uh, to democratic accountability because it is within the Treasury Department, which in turn is, of course, operating uh, under the president who faces re-election every four years, um, that you would have a kind of accountability there that would render it, uh, I think, a palatable form uh, of uh, public bank investment um, uh, of the kind that we're talking about here, basically massive infrastructure investment, but also other kinds of investment that might be identified by the council as useful places to, to operate in order, again, to sort of greenify comprehensively uh, the American economy. Okay, finally, the third part of the plan, if you, if you think about those first two parts as being largely geared toward infrastructure and maybe heavy industry, uh, basically the biggest industries, um, at the same time, on the sort of smaller industry or smaller business side of things, uh, where we're thinking in terms of startups and innovative new small companies that might be coming up with new ways of doing things that are, again, more environmentally friendly uh, or more environmentally beneficial, um, we can restore the Fed, the Federal Reserve System, to something closer to its original mission. So this is another thing that seems to be kind of forgotten in, in more recent decades. But the Federal Reserve System, as originally founded in 19. 13 was effectively a kind of network of regional development institutions or development banks, basically meant to help finance or provide liquidity to small scale businesses and small farms in various regions across the country. And that of course is why the Federal Reserve is actually divided into uh, 12 distinct uh, regional district banks. The idea is that each district bank was meant to be particularly attuned to the economic conditions of its particular region, uh, and then to provide short-term funding uh, for small businesses and small farms and the like, essentially by discounting commercial paper, by purchasing short-term commercial paper from these sorts of entities. 
We got off of that particular mission for the Fed uh, over the course of the later 1930s and ever after. And of course, as most of you uh, know or have heard or sort of noticed, um, it is largely at this point a New York City centric institution that focuses and operates across the, the national economy, primarily through the middleman institutions of six or seven big dealer banks. Basically, it works on the economy through the financial system as centered in New York, rather than working across the economy on a regional basis through small businesses in the real economy, which was the original plan. It wouldn't be that difficult uh, to restore the Fed to that original mission uh, and thereby to make funding much more readily available to small startup firms and the easy way to do this would be, or the, the easiest sort of rubric under which to do this would be to say that, well, all right, the council that I mentioned before uh, is going to, in effect, develop every year what we would call, say, a national development plan or a national development uh, strategy. Um, that's the thing that's updated on a regular basis. Uh, and it determines by reference to what is in the interest of national development, what counts as productive. Um, and then we restore the Fed uh, to its original mission of making only productive, not speculative lending or doing engaging only in productive, not speculative lending. Those were terms of art um, under which or pursuant to which the Fed in its original incarnation operated. All we have to do is understand or interpret the word productive by reference to the notion of national development as defined by the National Development Strategy, as formulated by the National Development Council that I mentioned before as sort of plank one of the plan, put all of that together and you've got most of, you've got three quarters of the full financing plan that is laid out in the book that I mentioned before. Uh, and in effect, you've got the sort of optimal degree of coherence on the one hand, and sort of dispersion and um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, sort of pluralism uh, on the other hand, and all of it is well designed or well calculated to sort of mobilizing finance and directing it to where we need in order uh, to remake our productive capacity along uh, green lines. And finally, all of it amounts to incremental changes to existing institutions of a sort then that ought not to be too terrifying, even to the more conservative members uh, of our national legislature. Uh, and with that, I'll stop for the time being and, and thank you guys for your patience. This is the, the, the book that Professor Hockett was talking about. If you can see my, my screen, Financing the Green, Green New Deal, A Plan of Action and Renewal. And in this book, you will find, you know, details about the plan that he uh, spoke about and, and the institutional structure of that uh, National uh, Development Council. And I would also like to, to highlight, uh, oops, oh yeah, yeah, two, one other book is called The Uninhabitable Earth. It really lays out in a great detail the consequences of not acting to address uh, climate change and what the earth might look like if climate change is left to uh, run amok. And also another important book since we're, you know, this is a series about economics. I think uh, Donut Economics by Kate uh, Roworth is a very uh, good book to understand how economics uh, can uh, be used to understand the way in which our economy needs to be structured to both address climate change, but also uh, be more sustainable in the future. Uh, another great resource is the latest IPCC report that just came out. If you're feeling ambitious, you can go ahead and read the whole report, it's thousands of pages. But if you have limited time like I do, I would suggest you go and read the technical uh, uh, summary and that would, uh, it has basically in great detail and in a, a few dozen pages, all you need to know about the report. And also what Professor Jenkins talked about was the Net Zero America uh, study. If you'd like to know, to, to get more details about it, these are the links below and also the link for the repeat uh, uh, project. Great, and I just wanted to emphasize yep. the, the recommendation to read the technical summary from the IPCC rather than the summary for policymakers, which is shorter, but also negotiated by all the political appointees. 
if you want the actual words of the experts, go to the technical summaries. Um, and working group two, uh, working group three, which is the group that I contribute to the, the climate solutions piece uh, is out just last week. So um, brand new as well. So if you want to Yes. Figure out how screwed we are, read chapter working group two. <laughs> and if you want to figure out how we're going to get unscrewed or at least partially unscrewed, uh, we'll read uh, working group three. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Jenkins, for that uh, recommendation. Okay. Let's look at the QA box. Uh, for everyone, feel free to continue to drop your questions in the QA box. I will we'll, we'll go uh, through all of them. Yeah. Happy to, to tackle Walker's question there, but at the top, um, yes, I think he noticed, uh, which I should have called out uh, as well, that all of the scenarios in the Net Zero America study, including even our frozen policy case, actually use about the same or less total primary energy uh, in 2050 than they do now, um, which is perhaps surprising. The economy continues to grow in all of our assumptions at the sort of standard uh, projections used in the annual energy outlook of the U.S. Energy Information Administration. So population, GDP are growing, demand for energy services is growing. Um, so why isn't, why is total energy demand falling? Uh, and there's a couple of main reasons for that. Um, they have to do with the conversion of primary fuels into what we actually care about, which is energy services, right? You don't care about a, a BTU of heat content in a you know, mole of gas, you care about the heat in your house or the uh, mobility in your car. And so there's two things that are going on there that help drive down total primary energy demand. One is by a virtue of the counting methods used here, we treat renewable energy inputs like wind and solar uh, and geothermal and even nuclear, I think in this case, as 100% efficient. So we don't count the wind that spills around the turbine as you know, waste, um, right? So we take the electricity out of the wind turbine or the solar panel as directly you know, uh, uh, converting to electricity. Whereas for you think about a coal-fired power plant that might be 40% efficient or a even 55, 60% efficient gas combined cycle power plant, you know, half of that energy is lost converting from primary input to energy carrier in the case of electricity. And then at the end use side of things, an internal combustion engine vehicle is a pretty inefficient way to move the wheels of your car. Um, of the energy in your gas tank, maybe only about 15% of it makes it to the wheels in terms of traction power. Whereas uh, an uh, electric vehicle is about 90% efficient at taking the energy in your battery and you know, turning it into traction. Um, similarly for heat pumps in buildings, you know, boilers are pretty efficient, right? You just burn a fuel and you get heat out. So there are something like 95, you know, percent efficient. Um, same with resistive heating from electricity, but a heat pump isn't converting electricity. It's just or converting energy. It's moving it around. And so it can violate that hundred percent efficiency limit. Um, and so heat pumps have what's called a coefficient of performance, which is how much electricity do you have to put in to move one unit of energy in or out of your house or your refrigerator or whatever else you're using for your heat pump. Um, and they typically are, are you know, 300%, 400%, even 500% efficiency, um, unless it's really cold out, um, and then their efficiency drops closer to 100%. Um, heat pump performance is getting better and better so that even in cold weather climates, you can get more than 100% efficiency, uh, even when it's really cold outside, because there's still a little extra heat out there you could pull into your house uh, to heat things up. So as an end result of that, we're dramatically improving both conversion of fuels into electricity and then conversion of electricity into final energy services. And so even though we're a much wealthier, bigger economy in 2050, total energy demand falls. There's also some end use energy efficiency in our modeling, you know, just getting better at sealing our buildings and, and process improvements and in, in industry, which continue to happen. Um, but actually the biggest chunk of the demand, we actually break this down in the study, the biggest chunk of the demand reduction is in the end use side is from conversion, is from electrification. Um, there's also a little less energy used in oil refineries when you don't need so much oil uh, or petroleum products. So we save more upstream there. So all of that kind of ripples through the economy and electrification means a lot higher efficiency as well. Okay. I think I can cover the second question by the anonymous yeah. attendee about, uh, about the Fed programs. Um, so that's, that's actually a terrific question uh, and um, it kind of plays right into the plan that I was talking about. Um, so first I'm just gonna reference um, a, a bunch of work that I put out at the time that these programs were underway in, the, uh, in early 2020. Uh, if you Google my name on the one hand and the phrase spread the Fed, uh, on the other hand, you'll find a whole bunch of written work on this. Short playing version is this, um, the Main Street lending programs on the one hand and the municipal liquidity facility on the other were the two sort of new 
few Fed programs that people had lots of high hopes for uh, in early 2020, because finally the Fed was actually looking uh, at clients who were not sort of the usual suspects, right? The great big Wall Street uh, banks. And so there was a lot of hope uh, that communities, towns, cities, even states would be benefited by the municipal liquidity facility on the one hand, uh, and that more Main Street or sort of smaller businesses uh, finally would be uh, assisted by the Fed once again for the first time in almost 100 years uh, through the Main Street lending groups. There were two problems. Um, uh, the first was that each of these programs was administered out of only one of the regional Fed banks rather than being spread over all of the uh, Federal Reserve regional uh, district banks as you would have expected, right? So Main Street lending was administered entirely out of the Boston Fed. And it's kind of absurd, isn't it, to think that somebody in Boston or somebody on State Street is going to know better than somebody in, say, San Francisco, um, what the needs of some small California business are. Um, that's just crazy, right? And yet there you had a San Francisco Fed that could have been administering the Main Street lending program in California and throughout its particular district. And of course, you could have had um, in the Cleveland Fed administering its version of the plan or you know, basically catering to the business of, businesses within its, its piece of the Rust Belt and so forth. But it was all done out of Boston. It was all done with a, a rather sort of a shoestring staff, a very small number of people. So basically that plan, that particular program would have worked much better if we had spread it over the entirety of the Federal Reserve System as you would have expected in the first place. Same story basically in a nutshell with municipal uh, liquidity facility. There, everything was done out of the New York Fed. What do um, you know, 5, 10, 15 New York Fed people know about the special problems or special needs of Peoria, Illinois, or what have you? Um, not very much. And I say this not with any uh, intention of being sort of disrespectful to those folk. That's where I used to work at the New York Fed. And those are very gifted, very serious-minded public servants, but they are small in number. And it's crazy to think that a small number Number of people right off of Wall Street, basically, uh, in, in lower Manhattan, are going to be able to administer at appropriate scale and with appropriate speed a program meant to aid all of the small towns um, uh, and, uh, and, and states of the country who are finding it difficult during the pandemic to finance their operations because of the freeze uh, in the municipal bond uh, market. So spread the Fed <laughs> and you would have gotten this done right. Okay, thank you so much, Professor. Sure. Uh, okay, I think uh, just a quick follow up question is that I think there's also a, a proposal in your book of the People's Fed, where you're talking about basically having uh, people have accounts in the Fed as opposed to having them in, in, in a commercial mm -hmm. bank. Maybe that also would have uh, alleviated some of the problems with uh, the response to the COVID 19. Yeah. Pandemic. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Zachariah. That's that's the uh, that's actually the fourth plank uh, of the plan that, just in the interest of time, I didn't mention. But another part of the plan is indeed uh, to essentially uh, make available to all citizens and all businesses and all legal residents of the country a digital wallet uh, that can be used on a smart device of any kind. It might be a smartphone or some other kind of smart device um, and basically enable um, everybody then to save money in these particular wallets, have the Fed offer uh, a nominal interest rate on those particular um, um, wallet accounts as well, that um, it can then raise that interest rate in order to slow down spending. If you've got an inflation problem underway, it can lower that interest rate or even drop helicopter money into those wallets if you need to sort of stimulate um, uh, more buying activity or more transaction activity. Um, basically, you, be, you would have, a, in effect, what I call leak-proof monetary policy because you wouldn't be relying on middleman institutions uh, like banks. To make it all the more delectable to you guys, um, there's a sense in which we have the sort of uh, rudiments of a, of a system like that already in place. If any of you Google um, the one word, Treasury Direct, uh, with a capital T and a capital T, uh, D, Treasury Direct, uh, any of you right now, if you want to, can open an account with the U.S. Treasury Department in, out of which you can then purchase uh, U.S. Treasury securities and into which you can redeem uh, U.S. Uh, Treasury securities. Um, so all you would have to do to put a plan of the kind uh, that I propose with the, the, the People's Fed uh, in place would be effectively to convert uh, TDAs, Treasury Direct Accounts, into digital wallets and then add horizontal P2P connectivity to them to complement the current sort of vertical connectivity between them and the Treasury Department. I contacted US Digital Service um, in March and April of 2020 
Um, that's the federal agency that does the sort of upgrading of government technology. Uh, and I asked them how long would it take to convert uh, existing uh, Treasury Direct into something along these lines. Uh, and they said it would just take maybe three or four months. It really wouldn't be that difficult. Technically, it's not that difficult a proposition. It's mainly just a political thing or just an inertia thing that we have to get past. But we have the makings for that kind of thing already. And that would be an interesting uh, repeat of a certain bit of our history because the first dollar bill as distinguished from a bank note put out by a private sector bank in the U.S. was the greenback, which was put out by the Treasury Department. So I call this the Treasury Greenbacks Plan. I'm, I'm sorry, the Digital Greenbacks Plan. And you could start a Treasury like that, and then integrate it in to the Fed's fuller monetary policy apparatus um, at whatever rate of speed the Fed would be comfortable with. It'd be very easy to do. Um, I call that the ultimate. Uh, the end of it is you know, I call it the democratic digital dollar. Uh, I think that's yeah, basically yeah. going to come. It's pretty much inevitable. But the only real question is when. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Hockett. There's a, another question to Professor Jenkins about uh, the pros and cons of carbon tax and carbon credits and carbon trading. Yeah, so, I mean, this is the, envir the environmental economics, you know, prescription for the externality or unpriced damages caused by climate change is to price it into the product, right? So, if we were to be able to estimate the damage caused by a ton of greenhouse gases and then add that cost into uh, market transactions and all of our distributed decisions should, you know, internalize that cost and we'll consume less and we'll turn to uh, cost effective solutions and, and that'll ripple through the economy. And that, you know, in theory is an incredibly powerful tool that we have at our disposal. Uh, in practice, I could maybe link to, maybe Ascari can pull this up, uh, my Climate Center policy brief on the limits of carbon pricing. I mean, in practice, the challenge is that making energy and all other products that use energy more expensive is politically quite difficult. Um, the distributional impacts of that policy are significant. And while you generate a lot of revenue, by distribution, I mean who wins and who loses, right? Different companies who are going to lose revenue, others that are going to gain, households that are going to pay more, uh, others are going to pay less. Um, and while you can, you know, the theoretical solution to that is to raise all the money from carbon pricing and then redistribute it amongst, uh, to people, the digital wallet would be a way to make that a lot easier. Um, it's very difficult to line all those distributions up with the, you know, the sort of dislocation. And so what you end up with is a really big political problem, right? You're, you're, you're shifting a whole bunch of wealth around. It's similar to, you know, implementing a substantial new tax policy with a bunch of redistribution. And um, while it would be great policy in practice, what we see in reality is that where it is priced in, which, you know, is a growing number of countries and, and regions that have a carbon price in place, they tend to be fairly modest prices, although that's fortunately starting to change in the European Union where prices are now rising in their emissions trading program. Um, quite a bit below what we would expect the full social damages of climate change are. So that even where we are internalizing, we're internalizing only a portion of that cost. And so all that's to say carbon pricing is powerful. We should do it where we can, where the politics uh, permits it. But we should also be pretty straightforward about the political economy challenges going into it. And if you want to try to implement it, it's not enough to just say, well, it's efficient and therefore a low cost way to cut emissions. We have to pay very close attention to who wins and who loses and how politics are going to interact with that distributional outcome in order to constrain its implementation. If we're smart about tackling that head on and implementing carbon pricing in a, a proactive way that tackles some of those political economy challenges, we can make a lot more progress. My view is that in the United States, States, it's unlikely that's going to be a primary mechanism in the near term. And so even where it is, and we have a small carbon price, like in New England's power, the uh, Mid New England and Mid-Atlantic states have the Reggie Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative for the power sector. So there is a little carbon price there. There's one in California. Um, we need to supplement that with other more direct subsidies um, in each sector and or standards in each sector. And one of the advantages of those sector by sector policies is while they are inefficient in a static context today, right now, if you just consider all the relative ways you could cut emissions, um, they tend to pick higher cost ones to target. In a dynamic context over time, they drive innovation in some of the harder to abate or higher cost sectors, uh, which makes it easier and easier to take more action in the future. And they can also build up the political and financial interests in sustaining those policies. So you think about the growth of the wind and solar sector and the lobbying power that they can now bring to bear um, on this debate, uh, the growth of electric vehicle interests, et cetera, those are spurred 
by initial subsidies and markets and standards that are standards in the markets that they create, um, which can ideally lead to both lower cost of action and greater political will for action over time. Um, and so from a dynamic perspective, it's often, I think, the best route to take and really, in some cases, the only route we have available politically. So that that's an, in a nutshell. I'll, I'll drop a, a link in the chat to a more articulate policy brief I wrote for the Climate Center that gets into that in a bit more detail. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Jenkins. I think there's an, another question probably to you talking about uh, mining of minerals, you know, cobalt, manganese, nickel, you know, for batteries. And so does the Net Zero America study, for example, model the, the emissions effect and the damage, you know, effect from this mineral, yeah. increased mineral extraction? So great, great question. Um, it was actually on our to-do list, I have to admit, and we ran, we did not have the additional staff that we needed to finish that task. Um, we wanted to tackle minerals constraints because it is a potential supply chain bottleneck. Um, there isn't really any significant materials limitation in terms of the raw materials available, but the scale at which we have to scale up and deploy these technologies does mean we're likely to encounter near-term bottlenecks in our ability to scale up and extract those, techno those uh, critical materials. Um, so we were gonna try to tackle that as one of the you know, key downscaling efforts, but we didn't have time to do that. So it's a key limitation of the study. I will say from a emissions perspective and even from a broad environmental damages perspective, um, the amount of minerals needed for you know, rare earth turbines or um, you know, uh, uh, electric vehicle batteries and motors and things like that is quite minuscule compared to the raw volume and environmental damage caused by fossil fuel extraction each year. Where literally, I mean, we're consuming a million, you know, 20 million, 18 million barrels a day of oil in the United States, right? That we just rip out of the ground and light up into the atmosphere every day. Um, about 100 million barrels globally. And that's just oil. We, we now are down to about 650 billion tons of coal each year that we consume in the United States, but it used to be over a billion. Globally, it's increasing at several billion tons. Um, so these are important uh, uh, environmental impacts to think about, to structure supply chains in environmentally sustainable and humane ways, because for example, cobalt largely comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo right now, where mining conditions are pretty abhorrent. Uh, lots of child labor and forced labor and very, you know, poor safety standards. So, you know, we need to be ensuring the highest standards for these supply chains, but it's not anywhere near the same scale of damage and impact that we're occurring today in our fossil energy infrastructure. And I think we have to keep both of those things in our minds at the same time. We are ameliorating a lot of environmental harm and resource extraction by transitioning away from fossil fuels, even if it does involve this mineral requirement. Uh, okay, yeah, thank you so much. There's a, uh, one last question, probably since we're almost out of time from Aaron Regan. So the question is about, you know, what, what's next? So what are the next steps that you envision, especially, you know, since the Build Back Better Act looks pretty much dead right now so so what do you what do you think are the next step and uh, especially politically at this point considering yeah. political reality what what can we do so i wouldn't i'm not going to count anything dead until this congress recesses um we still have time uh and i think that the geopolitical context has shifted around energy in a remarkable way after putin's unprovoked invasion of ukraine and that casts a light on another very salient and important rationale for pursuing this kind of energy transition, which is that it makes the United States and our economy and our households and consumers far more energy secure. Um, you know, you hear a lot of pressure to drill baby drill and increase our production as the way to kind of help Europe get off of Russian uh, oil imports. And that's, you know, one thing we could do. Um, but that does nothing to protect the US economy itself from economic energy insecurity. I like to talk about two different types of energy security. One is physical energy security, right? Do you have enough energy to meet your own needs domestically if those supplies were disrupted by a global conflict like the one we have now? Europe doesn't have that and that's a significant problem and we should do what we can in the United States to help Europe secure its energy supplies without needing Russia where they're sending a billion dollars a day uh, to pay for oil, coal and gas right now. Um, but if you look at the United States, we are now net exporters of all fossil fuels individually. We export more coal than we consume. We export more gas than we consume. 
consume um, or on net, and we um, then we import and we export more oil and refined products than we import now. So we are energy self-sufficient. We are technically physically energy secure, and yet any of you who have gone to fill up your gas tank can see that we are not actually energy secure because our economy is still dependent on a globally priced commodity that can shoot through the roof anytime a crazy dictator on the other side of the world decides to invade his neighbor. Um, and so I think that changes the context for the Build Back Better Act's energy provisions right now. Um, and I think gives us one last shot to get something over the finish line. And so I'm you know, working on that cross fingers, um, but all of you can stay engaged on that front. Um, and I would, you know, don't stop till the fat lady sings or the ref blows the final whistle or whatever metaphor you want to use, because um, this is our last real big chance to get something done at the federal level. Yeah, two, two quick additions. Um, with Jesse, I would say don't count out Build Back Better yet. Some version of it is likely still to get through. Mansion, for example, has not nixed every single thing. So there is some kind of common core that I think we can get through. That's the first point. Uh, and, and I think it's likely to happen. Uh, and then the second point is, um, I hate to, hate to give you something more to Google, but if you Google invest America plan as one word, um, there is a sort of a plan A version uh, in that of the, of the book plan. Uh, and then there's a plan B version. The plan A version uh, supposes that we have majorities in the Senate and the House. Um, the plan B version is everything that the Biden administration can do to replicate or to approximate the full bore plan uh, without uh, uh, congressional majorities. In other words, there's a lot that can be done through executive action, not through executive orders, but just executive action. The, the president has lots of discretion, for example, in how he configures and uses his cabinet. He has lots of discretion in who he brings on board in an ex officio capacity to help advise uh, a cabinet. That means that a version of the National Development Council could be impaneled tomorrow without any legislation at all. Much that the FFB that I mentioned before can do already without needing new legislation to authorize it. And finally, the Federal Reserve Act has never been changed since 1913 in any way that would prevent the Fed from operating in that kind of regionally dispersed way that it used to operate that I mentioned. That has not been legislated out of existence. That's just a change of practice. So you don't even need new legislation to spread the Fed in the way that I was talking about before. It has all of the authority it already needs to do that. Indeed, it's arguably mandated still to do that according to the 1913 Federal Reserve Act. So even if we don't get the Build Back Better Act, and I think we definitely will get a version of it, but even if we didn't, there's much more that could be done, even just through the Plan B version uh, of the books plan, which I call the Invest America plan. You'll find that in Forbes if you're interested, or just follow up with uh, Zakaria, and we can, uh, we can give him any additional um, readings that any of you guys might want to have a look at. Okay, that question, I think it was a, a great way to, you know, conclude this uh, uh, event. Thank you both so much, Professor Hockett, Professor Jenkins, for your insight, for your expertise, for sharing your knowledge with us. And thank you to everyone who attended and enriched this Q&A session with their uh, questions. And... This concludes Economics for the Coolest Scientists. I hope that everyone benefited. We'll make sure to share with you the recording of this event and prior events, and also some of the resources that uh, Professor Hockett uh, uh, mentioned. Okay, with that, I hope that everyone has a great rest of their, uh, their day. Thanks everybody, Thanks so much, take Dad. care. Thanks.